Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is your host, Kyle Buller. Today on the show, I'm very pleased to have on Dr. Harvey Schwartz and Veronica Gold from the Polaris Insight Center. So the Polaris Insight Center is dedicated to the ethical and compassionate clinical use of ketamine-assisted and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. And the team over there shares a deep interest and broad range of experience working with the psychotherapeutic potential of non-ordinary states of consciousness, and they're also committed to the integration of alternative and traditional methods of psychotherapy. Their founding members are all MAPS-trained clinicians who have participated in both Phase two and Phase three clinical trials of the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, and uh, they also provide training programs for psychotherapists and within the ketamine realm. So a little bit about our guests here today. I'll start off with Dr. Harvey Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz has worked as a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice in San Francisco since 1985 and is the co-founder of the Polaris Insight Center. He has received his PhD in clinical psychology from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia in 1982. He has specialized in treating complex PTSD, uh, severe dissociative disorders, survivors of organized abuse experiences, and individuals working on psychospiritual development. Harvey has provided consultation and supervision for therapists at various levels of professional development over the three decades, and currently offers psychedelic integration therapy as well as consultation for clinicians working in in the psychedelic-assisted therapy field. And his approach blends uh, relational psychoanalytic and archetypal transpersonal and existential therapy traditions. And again, he you know, went under the training for uh, MAPS and then also ketamine training and serves as a trainer in two ketamine training center trainings and is currently served as a sub-investigator and co-therapist for the MAPS MDMA assisted psychotherapy phase two and phase three trials. Veronica Gold, you may remember Veronica uh, from a previous episode. Uh, It was really great to have her on in the past to talk about the various uses of ketamine. So Veronica is also a co-founder at Polaris Insight Center as a licensed marriage and family therapist and has expertise in in uh, the treatment of trauma. Her approach is integrative and informed by somatic therapies, contemplative practices, and mindfulness. Uh, She's also interested in educating others about the healing and transformational potential of non-ordinary states of consciousness. If you want to learn more about uh, Veronica's work, definitely go back into the Psychedelics Today podcast archive at psychedelicstoday.com or on your favorite podcast app and check out that episode of Veronica Gold. I believe it was called like the various uses of ketamine therapy or or something along those lines. But it was a really great episode. We talked about different approaches with ketamine and then also uh, chatted a lot about um, incorporating somatic techniques into that practice. So in this episode, uh, we... We really chatted about some updates with some of the uh, the maps uh, work, and also Veronica and Harvey working as co therapists. And then we also dig into a little bit about their ketamine training at Polaris Insight Center, which was really awesome. I have taken two of the five modules, so they have five modules. It was about like a eight hour live class. I think I did it on a Monday, which was really. Great, great way to sp- spend the Monday and learn all about ketamine. So they have five modules. I did the two. They're wonderful. I'm hoping to complete the rest of them. If you want to learn more about their training opportunity, you can check that out at polarisinsight.com and click on the tab for clinicians. So they provide didactic, experiential, and residential training in ketamine-assisted therapy. And these programs are designed to provide physicians, psychologists, therapists, nurses, and other healthcare professionals with principles and procedures of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and how to use ketamine in combination with psychotherapy in clinical settings. They have some of the modules coming up. So again, definitely check that out at polarisinsight.com and then click on the tab for clinicians. Uh, Highly recommend it. And I think they just got approval for uh, CE credits for it as well. So uh, again, check that out and um, won't chat any more about it. You'll learn more in the episode. So 
If you like what we do here at Psychedelics Today, we'd love if you followed us on our social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and also if you feel called to it, leave a review on iTunes. That helps to boost us, our, our ratings over there, um, helps us to, to get the podcast out there. And if you want to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash psychedelics today and give a little monthly donation, help to keep the lights on over here. And one of the best ways to also help support the, the show and our project here is to share content. So, um, you know, go on our blog, share that around your social network. Um, and if there's a podcast you like, you know, share it around, let people know that you're listening to it. Yeah. We love the support. Thank you everybody. And then some little updates on our end. So we have new dates for our navigating psychedelics, uh, for clinicians and therapists course. This, uh, kicks off March 11th through May 9th, two groups, the first time is at 2 p.m. Eastern, and then the second group starts at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can learn more at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Check out the dates. Check out you know, all the info over there. And if you've been listening to the show, you've probably heard about it. So if you haven't signed up yet, hope to see you in class soon. Again, our spring dates are up, so you can check that out, psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And definitely check out any of our other courses up there. We have a really great course on Carl Jung and psychedelics, and then also the psychedelics and shadow course, which is really great. Pair those two together. You'll um, definitely, definitely love that if you're uh, interested in Jung and, and exploring the shadow. Again, that's psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And thanks so much for listening. And we'll catch you on the other side. And I hope you enjoy this episode with the co-founders of Polaris Insight Center, Dr. Harvey Schwartz and Veronica Gold. Hello, welcome back everybody to Psychedelics Today. Today, I have the honor to be joined by Dr. Harvey Schwartz and Veronica Gold from Polaris Insight Center. Really excited to have you both here to chat about what you're doing over at Polaris. It's been really exciting. I just um, was part of two of your uh, CAP therapy training modules um, over the past, uh, what was that, September and maybe end of August or October. Um, really awesome, been enjoying your work a bunch. So we'll just do a brief little introduction. And for those that want to dig back into the podcast archive, you can go back and check out Veronica's episode if you want to learn more. But we'll open it up. And Veronica, do you want to give us a short little background about your work and who you are? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having us. It's exciting to be here. Uh, so I'm Veronica Gold. I am a psychotherapist here in San Francisco, California. I originally come from the Czech Republic where I was a psychologist. And I'm one of the co-founders with Harvey of the Polaris Insight Center, where we provide ketamine-assisted psychotherapy training and consultation. And I'm as well uh, one of the therapists on the MDMA clinical trials for the treatment of PTSD sponsored by MAPS. And, you know, I have been before a therapist in private practice. I still have a small private practice where uh, I saw mostly clients with um, PTSD, anxiety, and I've done EMDR, somatic experiencing, and just variety of um, kind of a uh, integral psychotherapy. Awesome. Thank you. And how about you, Harvey? Great to be here. I'm Harvey Schwartz. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been in private practice in San Francisco for a long time, I think since sometime in the early to mid 80s. And uh, prior to getting involved in the, I guess what we call the psychedelic renaissance, I have had a long and um, deep career in, in the world of complex PTSD and dissociative identity disorder and working. And I've been written a few books and a few articles and teaching people how to work with uh, people who have survived extreme childhood malevolence of different kinds, particularly those who come from backgrounds in what we refer to now as organized child abuse or organized sexual abuse. Um, everything from human trafficking to child pornography, child prostitution, and cults. And so that's been my specialty. And um, and then I happened to see a video about four or five years ago about MAPS doing work with MDMA and PTSD, and I couldn't believe this was going on all this time, and I didn't know about it because I was so steeped in this other world. I always had an interest in transpersonal psychology, shamanism, mysticism, and the interface, spirituality and psychology. And so this door opened. And I went through it and uh, got involved in the MAPS training at Veronica and a bunch of other people. And uh, the rest is kind of history. It's kind of changed my whole career path 
at the like 10th or 11th hour. And, uh, yeah, what, what, what's that like to, I guess, kind of have that traditional background and then be exposed to this psychedelic world? I mean, it sounds like you kind of were interested in transpersonal shamanism, but um, what, what's that been like to kind of and make I, that transition? And I had been exposed to psychedelics in my youth. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So for me, it was like an opportunity to bring all these threads together Sweet. before I was too old to do anything <laughs> about it. So like, it was really a rare opportunity, like all these different pieces of my interests. And uh, including group work and spiritual healing. Also, I work with a lot of people that have spiritual trauma mm. uh, of a varied kinds. And I thought this was such a great zone to be able to kind of really offer something. Um, so for me, it was a great opportunity to hybridize, integrate, synergize, and you know, soon to become an elder in the field. Awesome. Let's jump in and I guess we'll, let's start off with some of the maps work and then we can, you know, chat about ketamine and the training. So you guys are, co-therapist with the MAPS phase two trial. So any updates or anything that you want to share with our audience about that? Yeah. So, you know, me and Harvey have met through the MAPS training and, and, you know, kind of when we were being trained, we were not sure who's going to work with who. And so there was this kind of a time when we were trained as therapists and then uh, paired up and um, me and Harvey started working together. And it's been you know, a change from working as a solo practitioner to do co-therapy and really bringing in the uh, possibilities of that, that work and to work with the psychedelics and um, really learning from each other, supporting each other, supporting the, the patients. And, and so we've worked together on the phase two and now we are working on the phase three study. The phase three is just now in the middle. It's been you know, a little bit slowed down because of COVID-19 as, as, as everything else. Um, but we are continuing and, you know, so kind of that predicted rescheduling of MDMA in 2021, maybe now it's 2022, but uh, we're you know, grateful that we are able to continue to do the work despite what's happening. Awesome. Anything for you, Harvey? Yeah, I mean, so much to say about the MDMA trials. You know, after having, you know, I do long-term death psychotherapy with mm. people who have really polyfragmented personalities from trauma. And even though the DID population is actually not necessarily included in this particular protocol, I saw the possibility for such rapid transformation that happened in the cases that we treated, both in terms of the somatic uh, shifts and the cognitive shifts and the identity shifts, shifts in belief system. So it, it seems as if there really is, a, for most people, an available resource that can expedite therapy that usually takes you know, 10 to 20 years sometimes into like you know, probably two to five years, if not less, for some people who are really have complicated backgrounds. And then for people who have more simple traumatic experiences, probably even less than a year using the model. Mm. And then as far as co-therapy goes, I've been working by myself for 35 years. And we did a lot of co-therapy in graduate school. And most people do that. But then because of the economics of mental health, the need for services, even in clinics, we don't get to do co-therapy much anymore. So this was an amazing opportunity to revisit that at a kind of a more mature stage of my career. And then Veronica and I have like a really deep shared interest in PTSD and trauma mm -hmm. work. But she's so much more somatically fluent. And my training is more like relational psychoanalytic and, uh, and shamanism. And uh, so it was a really interesting blend of, you know, areas of commonality and then areas of, of a balance. I learned a lot always from working with her. Yeah, just, you know, being in the training with you, you both, like just seeing the synergy there between the somatic and some of the transpersonal stuff that you were presenting, Harvey, during the training. I was like, man... I love what you guys are doing. And it, it just feels like it really aligns with, um, you know, I guess some of my orientation and, and how I view things. And so, yeah, I just really appreciate that. And so I guess like, what is it like to step back into doing co-therapy? Like that's got to be, um, you know, different than, you know, being able to practice, you know, individually and then kind of stepping back in the room with another therapist. Like what are some things that you, you both learned on, I guess, how to show up together and, and be a team in, in the room when you're doing this therapy? And we could start with Veronica, if you want to jump in. Yeah, it's a yeah, great question, Kyle. And there's like a lot to think about. And I feel as well really lucky that we've kind of, with Harvey, it was such a such an easy way of being together. Because when you think about it, MDMA, 
therapy. It's like you're for eight or nine hours together with this person in the room, with the, with the patient. And, um, you know, you each bring your energy and background and kind of blend it together to support the, the client you're working with. And, you know, there are times when you might, might be kind of on the same page and there are times when you have different ideas and how can we come together and, you know, bring those ideas and kind of support each other. And so I felt in the work that we've done that we've been able to support each other in, you know, maybe going certain one direction and then going another direction. And it's, it's almost like a modeling of this, you know, kind of, um, good parental relationship for the client when you have like that, you know, if you, you, you have like a secure family or attachment that, you know, the parents will work together to, even if there is different opinion on different way and supporting each other, or if there is a conflict or some challenge that arises in the therapy with the patient to be able to facilitate those conversations with, you know, in between the three of us. So it, it has been, um, really beautiful and enriching experience for me, uh, to be able to work in this way. And, you know, the importance of really talking together. So we spend with Harvey a lot of time, you know, talking about the sessions after and preparing for the sessions and that there is this kind of ongoing relationship with each other and with, with the, with the, with the person we are working with. There's much more to say, but Harvey, <laughs> Yeah, so much to say. I mean, I'm thinking about a meta answer first, that I really feel that um, maybe this is true of all psychotherapy, but I think psychedelic therapy needs to be held in a wider net, kind of in a shamanistic or tribal model. And so most of the dyads I know who are working together really love each other. They become friends. They become almost, you know, professional spouses in a way. And so when the patient comes in or the client comes in, they're entering a field where there's already kind of a love and trust bond growing. And if you work at a clinic where you've stewarded a kind of familial sensibility where everybody is, you know, kind of trusting with each other, then when the patient walks through the door, they're also going to feel the sense of coherence and collegiary that's produced by a a well-working clinic. So just on a dyadic level, I feel that, you know, Veronica and I, we get into a coherent place with each other before the person arrives. And we kind of have our tasks, like there's certain things that Ronnie is really good at. Like I'm just not really, really great with certain details. Mm. And Ronnie is really great with details. So she'll do certain things and I'll do certain things on the computer, certain writing things because of the language uh, ability differences with written, you know. And so there's kind of like a flow, uh, but all the while there's a coherence and we just sort of know what to do. And then there's kind of a playfulness and also a med- mindfulness in the room. And so sometimes there's long periods of silence and just music. And so we are feeling each other and coherent feel with each other. And it's a beautiful space to be in and kind of a blessing to be able to work while also experiencing kind of coherence, you know, and then there's moments of like maybe not knowing what to do right. and different ideas. And so we tend to actually bring it to the patient. We'll just sort of say, you know, Hey, we have these two different ideas about how to go this way or that way. And then it becomes like a three-way collaboration modeling non-competitive non-hierarchical familiar relationships and then there's areas where i just have this instinct like veronica like something's happening somatically and although i've learned a lot from veronica i'm like still like in you know grade school when it comes to somatics i just think like and so it's almost like i give her permission and she gives me permission too sometimes just like go after something she knows i know about and then all of a sudden i just watch her like and she'll say oh Arby, go get this and set this up and then we do this whole kind of graph you know trend, uh, like holotropic breath work kind of body work mm. that i would never have been able to come up with and so i'm being like sort of a the nurse assistant or her as doctor in that moment and kind of marveling at the gift that she has and then seeing it work with the patient and also learning something new so there's all these different levels of participation you know it's, it's kind of magical really yeah, it's really beautiful. And I know um, before we were just kind of chatting about, I guess, like accessibility for co-therapy teams. And I wonder, you know, it sounds like this will probably be the protocol with MAPS, at least probably for a few years through through the FDA. And I wonder, you know, could other models maybe adapt this? Or what, what are the pros and cons here? Like, I know you, you mentioned that you don't do co-therapy within CAP sessions, but I don't know, what, what would you see like the, the future look like? Like co-therapy teams for psychedelic therapy or I'm 
I guess Harvey, you kind of mentioned like shamanic. When you said that, I was just thinking about like the ceremony I was in back in January and seeing these teams work together and how beautiful that is. Um, all the synergy between between everybody. But yeah, I don't know. I'm curious to brainstorm the future what, what this would look like. I, mean, I, I I'm a big advocate for co-therapy going forward. I think the way economically, for better or worse, it's probably gonna have to be done is with, you know, a more experienced therapist and a less experienced therapist and part of kind of um what do you call that kind of model like kind of from the middle from the renaissance where um or like mentorship like, or mentorship. apprenticeship apprenticeship yeah. yeah i was thinking about glass blowers during the middle ages and somebody would start apprenticing and so there's some problems with that model because it creates this certain kind of um, hierarchy within that and that also has to be worked out between the co-therapy team because unfortunately i think the economics of how this is going to come down make it really hard for two very experienced therapists to be able to earn enough money mm -hmm. because in general psychedelic work doesn't actually pay that well it's not, it's not going to i don't think i don't know everybody coming in the field realizes that um so it's kind of a mission of love and devotion and, and sense of mission you know but i do think i think co-therapy doesn't happen with cap partly because it's a three-hour session mm -hmm. i think if cap was a six-hour session or if we did double session then i think you just need that for the endurance and for the you know, shared mindfulness. Uh, but like I said, some clinics do that. At Phil Wilson's clinic, almost everything is done in co-therapy, and it's just a model there. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. yeah, I think I know what you're saying, Harvey, you know, about it, just the economics and, and that there is this idea of like, to make it really profitable is like scaling and where you can, you know, cut some costs, but what is the cost of that? And how can we, you know, move forward in the most, you know, ethical and helpful ways? And, you know, it is really, I think it's really difficult to imagine doing, for example, MDMA therapy session in, in a single person, if there is like psychotherapy, you know, there have been some more shamanic models of like holding space, but being alone to stay present for eight or nine hours, you know, there might be a session where there is a lot of silence, but there might be sessions where there's a lot of interaction. And, you know, and even in that, like you do get tired. So it's really helpful to have another person there or sometimes like, you know, you, you bring this other like view or other skill. So I hope there is a way that it can work, you know, and, and my hope is that, you know, that, that eventually this will be covered by insurance and that the insurance companies can really see the value of like the, the, the cost benefit, mm -hmm. even having two therapists, you know, like that the cost of that, if you compare like that treatment, as Harvey said, like maybe in the year, somebody who's been, you know, has severe PTSD moves from this place when they're not functional, where they need, you know, they, they, they might have de depression, be suicidal, you know, have, and, and we know the connection of trauma and physical illness. So a lot of people have a lot of physical struggles, go to emergency rooms, you know, might have a suicidal attempt and be hospitalized for two weeks. Like if you take the cost of all of that, it is so much higher and all the medications they will be using compared to even doing the co-therapy. But, yeah. you know, I think in the beginning, it's, it's, it's gonna, you know, have to be different and, you know, and their ideas. And I think that's, it's, it's a good, you know, way of, of, you know, what MAPS has been proposing. And I think it's still, you know, it's all in negotiations with FDA and kind of how that's going to look like, like what if it was a combination of a licensed professional and somebody who is not licensed, but maybe as a body worker or has a trauma informed background and them working together and, you know, or the apprenticeship model, but really we have to think about the power dynamics and then about the, the pay. Like we've mm -hmm. been, you know, feeling strongly that it's important that people feel kind of equal in doing this work and as partners. And so it's a, you know, it's kind of interesting way how to, how to, you know, like, uh, um, make this work and, and bring it in the ideal way without compromising on the quality of the, of, of, of the and the possibility of the healing the biggest issue going forward i feel like for the field is how do we create access scale up and not compromise the depth and intensity and integrity of the process yeah that's something joe and i often talk about um what does that look like and i mean what kind of casualties might come out of that when you do kind of um 
I guess, yeah, compromise some of that integrity, the way the models held the containers that you're creating. I mean, scalability is wonderful, right? Because we're being, being able to get people access to these medicines, but then also, yeah, what happens when those containers aren't tight? I don't know, having a transpersonal background, I always think about the weird transpersonal stuff that comes out of psychedelics or spiritual emergencies. And are we, I guess, ready to possibly deal with some of that stuff if it's like at scale where maybe that's not really held um, as much, but I don't know. I think there needs to be, you know, like uh, Russian nesting dolls. I, forgot mm. I think there needs to be containers and containers around containers and, you know, kind of collegial containers and supervisorial containers and commitment to ongoing growth and kind of authentic, honest communication. And all the therapists need to be aware of all the shadow elements that come into the work and be free to discuss them and not be inhibited. And we almost need to create a culture. That's what we're trying to do in our training, to create a culture of, um, you know, kind of like courage and fearless honesty about ourselves and about the work and humility and vulnerability and to have as much of an egalitarian approach to our patients and clients as possible for many reasons. But one of the main ones is to, in a way, undo the damage that many of them have had by being in the mental health system for as long as they've been in the mental health system, because so much gets laid down in terms of programming about, yeah. you know, worthlessness or failure or it's their fault. Or, and so I feel like a big part of this model is not just giving the medicine or doing the protocol, but kind of imbuing the person with a whole new worldview about what their struggle means and what their struggle is about as it's held in all indigenous cultures. Generally speaking, it's about a transformation opportunity and it's about a struggle of the individual that the community is responsible for, not an individual left alone with a problem to solve by themselves, feeling like a failure or drowning in shame because they're struggling with that. And so in some ways, I think we have an opportunity now to um, try to think of the right word, kind of like to really influence the, the contextual variables in which this work is happening, you know, beyond the protocol, like just kind of the attitude about the work that we bring these messages to patients while we're also treating them. It's almost like deprogramming them from the mental health system's long-term effect on their sense of self and identity. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that's huge. And, you know, as you're talking about that, I'm just thinking about... <sighs> Re reflecting about a program I was in, um, and it really kind of comes back to cost benefit analysis and this deprogramming. So I worked at a place that was a residential home for people experiencing early episode psychosis. And the way that it got pitched ironically was that the hurricane Irene knocked the psychiatric hospital out in, in Vermont. And so somebody um, went to the state and said, Hey, we want to create smaller community mental health centers and pitched all this research, um, from the old Soteria house that happened in the Bay area and saying like, you know, we can create a program where people can come here for three to six months and it's going to cost half of what it is that you're treating, it, you know, just hospitalizing people. And, you know, the state bought it and, and um, funded the program. And I think we were able to treat people, I, th I forget what the pricing was, anywhere between five to $800 a day per person. Um, and they could be there for three to six months versus, you know, how much does it cost to hospitalize somebody and paying for that type of care. And it was really interesting, but the deprogramming was interesting to, when we started to have people step back down from the psychiatric units to our program, it was like having to teach them, like, we're not trying to be part of that mental health system. We want to create a new model here. And it was very challenging because people thought we were part of it again, and then not wanting to engage in the pro program because there was like fear there of like, oh no, you're just part of the system again. Like I've been abused in this system. I don't want to have anything to do with this program. It's like, no, wait, we don't want you to ever go back there. We want to encourage you to, to try to move through this. And so that was, that was really challenging to kind of do that deep programming and I guess education when we are creating new models, right? Um, and I wonder, yeah, what we're going to kind of confront with the psychedelic um, movement and how that's going to really kind of shift and shape, reshape mental health systems. Yeah. I mean, you know, I appreciate that you got to be part of an experiment like that and saw some of the challenges in the experiment, you know, but I think it's everything from, you know, I think it's everything from patients take the medicine from a cup themselves, the little micro moments of like, they're choosing this, they're making a choice. They're bringing in sacred objects for an altar. They're co-creating, co-participating it and being less passive in the process. And that we're constantly, you know, the informed consent process or the prep process isn't just, you know, like the typical mental health prep. It's also trying to like imbue, a feeling of 
co-participation, collaboration, and to give permission. And I think I speak about this when we teach all the time, right? That we want patients, clients to feel that all of their various parts are welcome, their rage, their grief, and that they don't have to be afraid to express anything. And so given that they've been kind of trained into sort of like sub submission and kind of uh, take a pill, don't do anything, you know, report in, in a robotic way, we're really having to kind of create a whole new set of values and sometimes maybe run up against attachment to the old system, yeah. which is part of the healing, right? Same thing, or attachment to a pathological family system, right? The attachment to the pathological mental health system because it's all they've known and it's held them in some kind of provided some kind of container. And so there could be anxiety just leaving that world behind. So you talked about the other side of it, which is they feel like you're going to go back into it. There's also those who, over the years, I work with people who just, they came out of the mental health system, they looked up and then went back in. It's almost as if mm. people go back to jail for the same reason, because they couldn't feel contained anywhere else. It's like really, I think about a revisioning the whole, you know, mental health system and the way how we look at healing and how we look at psyche. Yes. And that, you know, that when people come and it's really like, like bringing the transpersonal and that's what we're, you know, do like talking about and trying to uh, help people see in the, you know, in the preparation. And then they'll have that experience when working with the psychedelic medicines and, you know, ketamine is a great example of really opening to the person and to the psyche much more than is from, you know, what happened in their lifetime. And so kind of, as we start to open a transpersonal, we are really seeing like, where the healing can happen and needs to happen. So like we, you know, and, and uh, believe it stands growth quote when he said, you know, like we can't, we, we are trying to heal the, like the whole of the psyche with this like small se se segment, right? Like we're looking at a segment of our life and we think like looking at what happened, that's how we're going to heal the whole person. And so that we have to really expand in the transpersonal field to the other realms, like the, the, the perinatal realm, the mystical, the collective, um, to be able to really get to that healing. And so I think when people suddenly start to see that, that's where they can as well start to see these, um, you know, what are the problems in the current mental health system? What are we trying to do? Like that, that you know, that they've been really taking medicine to suppress or to, like treat the, 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 the kind of the symptoms, but not the possibility of actual healing that we want to bring that there is that possibility of true healing and transformation. Um, yeah. And I, when you said like kind of bring psyche and I immediately was like James Hillman, <laughs> I'm always uh, thinking of some of his work and I'm paraphrasing this quote here, but um you know, I think it fits really well into psychedelic work too. Um, said, you know, psyche doesn't need to be treated. It needs to be served. And how do we serve psyche instead of trying to suppress it and treat it as if it's like, it's wrong? Um, how do we really listen to it? And, you know, kind of coming back to Groff's framework, inner healing intelligence, working with the inner healer, how do we really trust that process within people? Mm -hmm. And it's really challenging, I think, in the current mental health system, right? Because it feels like, maybe a liability. We need to contain it. We need to box it in, um, might get too big, but, but how could we learn how to trust that process a little bit more within people? It's like, how can we like start with being able to trust it ourselves, you know? And so that's what we, when we've created the, the ketamine training and, you know, it's really training. Now we're teaching ketamine assisted psychotherapy, but thinking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and this new approach to healing and, um, psychology and psychiatry in ways of like bringing these questions, you know, like how can we learn to trust that inner healing intelligence, trust that uh, greater process in ourselves so we can bring the trust to our clients. And that, you know, like the question of like, can there be a protocol or is it possible to have a protocol for psychedelic assisted therapy when it's this inner guided process that's unfolding where everything is welcome and we we don't know and we cannot know what it's going to look like for each person and so the really the role of the therapist is to be able to trust the process and step back and then be fully available for what is unfolding for the patient as they're you know the, the, and the, in the expanded state of consciousness 
And so we think it's it's through our own work and experience and, you know, ongoing exploration of consciousness and um, and engagement and, you know, consultation with the, about this work. So, yeah, kind of like a, like a new way of thinking, how to bring this, like, trust in this inner healing intelligence, something what we cannot really measure or, you know, quantify somewhere or put in a protocol in a way. Yeah. Harvey, you have anything you want to jump in? Yeah, like a hundred thoughts come <laughs> coming to my head. Um, that's why I don't do podcasts, right? I have, it's like, I have like all these bubbles that want to. Um, I think of the I think of these two words, mystery and mastery, mm. right? And I th- I feel like in mental health training we learn all about mastery, but not the mystery. And so somebody could be a CBT therapist and get CBT therapist, UMD or a therapist, somebody can become a psychoanalyst. And so there's a lot of emphasis on mastery and there's a danger with mastery because it could really shift into lacking in humility or fundamentalism. People get very attached to their tribes. One of my problems with the mental health world is that people are either this or that. And so I talk about in the training a little bit about, you know, to manualize or not manualize, you know, this is one of my concerns and with all due respect to manualization, it, they tend to lean heavily on the mastery. So like if there's a act model or a, you know, like for psilocybin or a DBT model, it's going to really be to the structures of that model and the outcomes will be measured to that model. And all of that has a certain beauty to it and a certain, it really matches Western science and also it matches Western capitalism. So it kind of all fits, but we're really on the side of trying to like make room for the, ma- for the mystery part. And knowing that we can, you know, we can be part of the mystery, we can sample the mystery, we're always learning from the mystery, our mastery has to be subservient or deferent to the mystery. And yet we can use our mastery to to embrace and work with the mystery. And so that's what I feel like we have to sort of almost change the training of the whole mental health profession in this way, you know, to synthesize these two things and to have people learn how to play in the mystery, whatever that means and however that, you know. Yeah, which, which has to, which has to do with chaos, the value of chaos and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's really hard. And I'm glad we're touching on this. It was one of the points I, I actually wrote down. Um, the one thing that stood out in module two is you talked about the dharma versus dogma and, and the protocol manualizing it, and also really kind of trusting the process there. And I'm wondering, you know, you, you have this training, and it sounds like this is something that you're trying to teach, like how do you pass that on? I feel like it, it is really tricky, and this is something that. Um, that we've actually run into a little bit in, in, in our breathwork training, like our, we've been trying to figure out like some of the body work, how do you teach that? And, you know, our, our teacher Lenny is always like, you, you know, there's certain techniques, but you really have to tune into the person and like follow that process. And sometimes I, we've noticed people getting just really wanting to know the technique and the protocol as if there is a protocol when it comes to some of this stuff. Um, and really hard to kind of teach that intuition, that more intuitive process to, to follow it and, um, to really trust it at a time. So I'm wondering, you know, have you bumped up against any resistance there from people where this is totally new and you're like, what are, what are you even talking about here? How, what do you mean? I just follow this process or, or be open to it versus like, I'm so used to getting step-by-step um, a manual to, to know how to um, react to certain things. It's a big question. I think people coming into the psychedelic field have to have a high tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty. It, it sort of goes to the territory and not all therapists do. And so I feel like there's a need for many different types of therapists in the world. And for those who really find structure more comforting and don't want to really work with their own character structure to overcome their need for structure, then maybe there's other fields that will be useful for them. And then I think what happens in psychedelic training is I've seen this happen on retreats where therapists who maybe have previously been more non-transpersonal actually open up to like this unbelievable intuitive gift or intuitive ability they have. And then they start going through a big identity crisis around like, well, what if I go back and tell my colleagues back home that I'm, mm-hmm. you know, you know, hearing, you know, hearing ancestral voices or you know, picking up things. And so I think there's a lot of support needed for therapists who are going through the, the transformation to become psychedelic therapists. And, the, you know, there's a risk for the, the mastery people to be too fundamentalistic, but there's also a risk for the mystery people. And we need to sort of be aware of this and teach them. The risk for the mystery people, all the intuitive people are everything I think is true or everything right. that's coming to me. And so there's kind of a, a risk of people getting reinflated or, you know, overly, overly enamored with their own 
intuitive abilities to the point where they're, you know, reading people at parties and telling, you know, giving psychic readings practically and intruding and not really double checking their intuition against other factors. So, you know, mastery and mystery both have risks, both have shadows. And I think teaching that is really important so that everybody kind of learns about, you know, uh, humility by walking down the center path between these possible errors that we all could make, being too rigid or being too loosey-goosey. Right. Yeah, Veronica? Yeah, no, I, you know, kind of like, there's like a lot to this question. What do you, what do you ask? You know, and I think in the training and, you know, it's really coming back to our own experiences, you know, and I think that <clears throat> it's at even more as a psychedelic assisted therapist is about the ability of going deep within ourselves and being able to look at and, and sit with our own suffering to be able to be with the clients that come and really being able to make space what unfolds for them. And that, so that is the best way of preparing, you know, like there is a lot of education that you can hear. And sometimes, you know, people who come to our training maybe are really interested in the field and have worked in, with psychedelics before, or there are people who are coming from like a much more structured world and want to learn about ketamine. And so maybe it's almost just like a priming of the process, but it's just this ongoing process of learning and exploration within ourselves and learning. And so I always come back to like doing our own work is the most important thing. And just having that, as, as, as the, you know, like being able to trust within ourselves and, you know, see where, like what parts of us we are afraid to go into, invite to come forth. And that that is the best preparation in being able to do this work. And then, you know, kind of be, being open to this variety of things that, you know, we are learning. And so we, we have this kind of ideal version of, of the training that it would be really, you know, over a year or two years or this just kind of like ongoing way of coming together and working with non-ordinary states of consciousness and learning from each other, with each other and being able to discuss the things that are coming up on really ongoing basis. That it's not like that you do a training or you even have like a program in school and then you're done and then, then, then you, you know, you're kind of finished in the development of, of being a psychedelic therapist that it's, and that's, I think it's, it's something what is exciting about it for me, that there is just this ever changing and developing way of, of doing this work and learning about ourselves to, to be able to serve better. Yeah. I mean, it's too bad that COVID happened when it happened for everyone for different reasons, but like Veronica and I and a couple of other colleagues were ready to launch uh, these more retreat training types of events similar to how we were trained by Phil Wilson and Julian Edwards, but with our own spin on it because we're more transpersonally oriented. And one of the things that happens is you're in a room full of people who are paired up over a four or five day period doing, doing uh, sitting for each other, being a therapist and patient, and then sharing in the group. So everybody's having exposures like 35 journeys in four days not just one or two journeys and mining all the different variables, including one or two people like freaking out and screaming and needing to maybe go to another room, people, you know, being confused with the transpersonal material that came up. So the kind of the group could participate in it. People experiencing cross dyad telepathic experiences, ketamine. And so you have this encyclopedic event of massive learning because you're exposed to so much, uh, so many dyadic processes. This, I think, Going forward, I think that's going to be the best way for people to continue to train. And then right now, we only have it at the individual, like at the um, like introductory level. But I think where it's really going to be most interesting, the thing I'm most looking forward to, is therapists who've already been working in the field for a while. So they're past the introductory phase. They've encountered all these challenges because we've all hit unexpected challenges and stresses. And now going to an intermediate level training where they're processing, learning, consulting, but also taking the medicine together and sitting for each other going into deeper places to work on their identity as healers, as well as uh, processing what's coming up with patients. So that's what I'm really looking forward to when we get to be in person again, you know, yeah. beyond the introductory. It's like beyond the introductory. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. 
And you, you bring up a really great point, both of you, just kind of like being able to do one's own inner work and the importance of that. And it sounds like, I don't know, in some conferences and whatnot, it's kind of like this weird taboo thing of like, should psychedelic therapists have psychedelic experiences, right? <laughs> and, you know, how, how do we how do we deal with that? Right. I mean, you know, we have certain techniques that, and and medicines that may elicit that, but right now it's it's so hard to maybe talk about, Oh, like, how do we do MDMA therapy? How do we do psilocybin therapy? You know, it sounds like ketamine that that's an option. Right. And, you know, you could also do maybe legal things like uh, cannabis and, um, you know, breath work and whatnot, but, um, yeah, I don't know any thoughts about that. Veronica? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a lot of thoughts about, about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and, one of our hot buttons. So. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely one of the controversies in the field, which to me feels like should not be a controversy because it's so, you know, but it's, you know, you're bringing up the good point. Like a lot of, you know, some of these medicines are not legal. And even ketamine, it's legally prescribable. So you have to have mental health, di- the health diagnosis to have ketamine prescribed to you or, you know, some physical uh, diagnosis and, you know, it's, ketamine is used for other indications. Um, and then there are other methods of, you know, entering into non-ordinary states of consciousness like holotropic breath work or drumming, dancing, fasting, sweat lodges. But is it is it the same? You know, there are some similarities, but I think there are, you know, as well, really distinct mm-hmm. features of each of the medicines we are working with. And as well, there's different depths, how, you, how deep you can go with the medicine and that the relationship which you have with the medicine changes over time. And you know, even though I've been familiar, for example, with MDMA and I've done, you know, when we talked before, I, you know, shared more about my history, ton of holotropic breath work, really do, being, part, you know, as, as, as a, the MDMA uh, therapist, we have an opportunity to apply to a study where the, like a, like a therapist or the healthy individuals can receive MDMA. So I did a session with Michael and Annie as a part of my training and, it, it had such, such an enormous value to how I've been able to be a therapist for the, the, the participants in the study to really understand that co-therapy model in, in, in a whole new different way, you know, and I wouldn't have been able to understand it in that way without that experience. And with ketamine, it's, it's such a different medicine. And so the part of our training was, you know, having our own experiences with the medicine and, and because of that, it, 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 we, you know, I believe that it's so important to have that experience and it is difficult because of the, this environment of like, yeah, it's not legally available for everyone. And how do we prepare for that? And can we ask someone to take medicine in order to be a therapist? And, and, you know, I can say, I would not feel comfortable being guided into a journey with someone who hasn't had experience with the medicine. Because if someone is like, yeah, I've done a lot of holotropic breath work and I've done a lot of meditation and I, you know, kind of am familiar with non-ordinary states, do they really know what it is like to be on this type of medicine? You know, so I think there is a limit. And so I have this bias that I think it's important to work with the medicine. But, you know, as we know, there are different, different opinions on that. Yeah. How do you want to add? I mean, you know, we, we share the same bias. And I mean, I, I even think that people who are working with medicine should also do holotropic breath work, shamanic drumming. You know, I've, I've been involved in a, in a movement dance form of um, therapy for a long time. And I think it kind of behooves therapists to not get too attached to like, oh, I'm a psilocybin person. So the other side of the equation is like the people really need to open their experiential uh, wings and flap through the many altered state experiences so they know you know how people around the world for thousands of years have been accessing things you know shamanic drumming is really important and movement heavy duty intense dance movement yeah. in a container but the other side of the equation is uh, you know, even though i'm biased in the same way that veronica's biased on these listservs these these arguments happen right mm-hmm. so i know that try to show interest in what the other side is saying and i think the two main points the other side has said is one is um there's a mental health crisis of such tre- of tremendous proportions happening 
that we need all hands on deck. And if a large number of those hands are people who don't feel comfortable taking psychedelic medicines, then right now so we have to find another way to train them. And then people coming out of 12-step programs who are feel any way whatsoever, even if it's for therapeutic use and training. So for that group of people, it presents a dilemma to respect their process and their uh, commitments and then find a way to include them in, in the work. So those are the two arguments that I've heard that make sense. And yet, you know, as a patient, I would want to know that my therapist has, has had fluency in all of these experiences. And as a trainer, I think if we had, you know, retreats that we hope to have, we also want to have these other options for other altered state experiences. Mm -hmm. So people are not just taking medicine mm -hmm. and tapping into the wide array of, you know, available methods and as many methods. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I know last year at Horizons, um, somebody brought that up to um, George Goldsmith of Compass because they were really talking about scalability and not giving experiences to therapists. And to one side, right, it's like, okay, we, ha we have these medicines, we have this mental health crisis, it's, it's wonderful to try to scale that. But I guess I always kind of come back to you know, like what type of casualties could come out of that by not understanding the space. And it's like, I don't know, I think about like shamanic training, right? You go years and years of intense training before even trying to offer that to somebody else. And, you know, I guess from a reach research perspective to try to stay really objective, you know, I guess that makes sense. Maybe not to have your own experience. If you're really trying to stay like, I don't know what this is like, maybe you can come up with new protocols, right? Cause you're not being biased, but I think for like a therapeutic context, that would be really important. I mean, you're lending your psyche to somebody, right? And I'd, I would hope that they would have maybe those like navigational skills to to pull you out of something or help you move through something that would come up that could be really challenging. So yeah, it's interesting debate. Yeah, yeah definitely. You know, and I think, you know, it's interesting what, you know, that, that other point too, around like a research, you know, but that the part of the protocol too is like, like helping the client to trust in that inner healing intelligence. And so I am not really sure you can be fully biased, you know, that like to be like, like we are, because I, like I have this with it, like almost the medicine will not take you there. Like the psyche and the medicine will not take you there. If you are there, like not joined with the patient and you're kind of this observer and being, well, let's see what happens and how this medicine works on you. I'm not sure that that's going to create the optimal set and setting for the psyche and the medicine to go where the person needs to, to you know, what, what needs to come up. Like and the things that will come up will come up that feel safe. You know, the person needs to feel safe. The psyche needs to feel safe. And to be able to enter into the depths of this transpersonal realms. Mm. And, you know, we can see that, you know, for example, with ketamine, that there is a huge difference with people who are bringing the transpersonal background and this more, you know, we can say shamanic or transpersonal holding of the space versus the medic, medi medicinal or medical model. And that the clients do report different experiences, even with the same doses of the medicine. And is it just the set and setting or is it just the music? Or is it really like this, the space that we hold that allows the patient psyche to go deeper, to go to, to you know, to the, the, the inner healing intelligence, to access things that will be safely held in that space? You know, that maybe this inner healing intelligence knows that if that's something what's not welcome or supported, it's not going to bring it up because it would be re-traumatizing for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, even in regular psychotherapy and hopefully... We've all been trained to know this, that patients can tell what their therapist can handle and can't handle. And they will tend to not go into zones that they unconsciously perceive that the therapist can handle. So when you add psychedelics to the mix, the transparency issue becomes even sort of greater. So there's a, there's a way in which there could be accidental restrictions of the therapist's limitations onto the process. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Little, oh, I have uh, one other thing to add. Yeah. Sorry, one other. Thing. This no. is kind of a little bit of a little bit of a downer topic, but I just wanted to throw this in for the bigger context. And that is that you were talking about casualties. So I want to riff off your odd talk on casualties because I have treated a large number of casualties of the mental health system, in addition to trauma survivors. And so we have to acknowledge that in the mental health system already, there is a vast number of casualties of all kinds, including sexual abuse misconduct by therapists, 
inappropriate termination, uh, people acting out power issues on patients, over-medicating them, acting out dominance and control issues, all kinds of... So we already have... That's a great point. Massive problems before psychedelics enter the field. And so I think we have to be really humble about like, we don't have like a tabula rasa, now we add psychedelics and it's going to dirty the waters. It's like the waters are really dirty, really messy. Lawsuits against therapists, including malicious lawsuits against therapists. Innocent therapists I know who have been prosecuted. So the field is already muddied. When we add psychedelics, the possibility for casualties is even greater because of the boundary dissolution that happens and the transference and countertransfers can get cooked very intensely and spending eight hours together in a room can dissolve boundaries. And so, yeah, I fear that if we scale up too fast, too quick, and don't have a really sustained education process for our, you know, our brothers and sister therapists in the world, we're going to really already make the same mistake that's been already made and maybe double down on those mistakes. And I fear that, you know, two or three bad public relations events um, can shut down the whole movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now, psychotherapy isn't going to be shut down as a force in society because, you know, 3% of people are sexually abusing their patients because psychotherapy is already an established field in, in the world, right? But psychedelic therapy, which is kind of just reemerged after the war on drugs, is still shadowed by the war on drugs. And so it feels like everybody has to be perfect in any actual mistakes or, you know, one suicide or one, you know, wacky therapist who loses boundaries and <clears throat> gets sexually involved and marries a patient or some other crazy story will hit the news. And the news loves that. And even though there's thousands of good psychedelic therapists, that one or two stories is going to have such power in the psychedelic movement yeah. now where it's at. So I feel like it's very vulnerable to disinformation campaigns based on limited bad experiences, you know? Yeah. And this is a very hot topic. Um, you know, there are people that kind of report things to, to us here at psychedelics today. And so Joe and I are always trying to have this conversation and we know, you know, there, there are things that are happening in the underground already, or, you know, things that are boiling up and it, it, yeah, it does like, we're always like, how do we navigate this as I guess, like a community of field? Um, because there is that fear there of like, you know, one slip up could screw everything up, but then also how are we addressing the harm that's possibly being done? And I guess I guess it's tricky when you're talking about underground because you know who are you reporting that stuff to and you know it's, it gets kind of muddied to begin with but I'm wondering you know as this field progresses and you're talking about like maybe doubling down on some things I'm wondering like you know with these boundary dissolution um, experiences it does feel like maybe we put ourselves maybe in maybe a little bit more vulnerable situations here. And then you're, you know, before we were talking about this idea of like mastery versus mystery, maybe, you know, when we go too far on the mystery side, when we maybe go like go way too over in the transpersonal, we go, well, it's, it's okay. Right. And ha yeah, as I guess, as a field, how, how do we navigate this and, and really, I guess, teach competencies to new therapists as, as we're moving into this space? Cause it's, it does, it seems very, very important as, as we move forward here. Yeah, and it's kind of ongoing conversation that has to be around ethics and the way of bringing this work forward. And so there are like a lot of codes of ethics and we think really being able to talk about what comes up, you know, in good and challenging ways. So people don't have, don't have a fear of talking about, you know, like some misstep that happens that's small that can lead to something bigger and really having ongoing conversation and community, you know, and I think that, in no way we can, you know, completely prevent things from happening. But like, you know, in the, in the, for example, in the MAPS model, like we work together and then we have a team that we talked with. And so we think that this, you know, in the ketamine, when we talk about like in the ketamine as a psychotherapy, oftentimes we work alone. And so at Polaris, we are, you know, we have a clinic, we have our colleagues, we have regular case consultations and all of us talk to each other. And, but then there are people who are in other parts, you know, or work really individually or have their own practice. And so how important it is to have this ongoing con conversations and consultation and supervision to, talk about this and as well, you know, bringing this to conversations that people who are receiving the treatment can talk about it because still the, the impact of the war on drugs, a lot of the patients, they, they come to this, they read Michael Pollan's book or, you know, listen to a podcast and want to get his treatment, but they still have fear about sharing about this treatment with their families or people around. And so the more information is out there, 
I think is the best way of, um, you know, minimizing these things to happen and as well normalizing, you know, that there is, you know, like when Harry mentioned suicide, there, there, there is a, a percentage of clients that commit suicide in regular psychotherapy. Right. And so that is going to happen in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy as well. And we, you know, are trying to do the, the best we can to, to support people in. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, there's no easy answer to your question, but I do think um, that to use a certain term that comes out of maybe more of my training and this is why we introduced the idea of counter transference work really early on in our webinars that basically like know your instrument and be able to talk freely about your mistakes and failures. And I think what happens in graduate school training, people are trying to impress their supervisors or keep information from the supervisor, withhold information. I think there's all the subtle games that go on in training that haven't been unpacked around hierarchy, dominance, approval seeking. And so I don't think people are trained to really like bring out the shadow of their own work and their own fears, their own incompetencies, mm -hmm. their own mistakes, and to have that be part of the conversation. So I feel like we have to create a, a environment where the norms for transparency and vulnerability are front and center in the psychedelic movement. And hopefully if that happens there, it'll trickle back down into the regular psychotherapy world. And to just have people know that everybody has felt these things. Mm -hmm. Everybody has had sexual feelings come up. Everybody's had aggression feelings. Everybody's been disgusted. Everybody's wanted to walk out. Everybody's want, everybody, we're human and we're fallible. And we need to really embrace our own fallibility with great humility because we're asking our patients to do the same thing. Right. And so I feel like in our training programs, I think you really have to start talking about counter-transfers and what makes it hard for us to talk about that and uh, be as excited about our failures as our, as our successes. It's wonderful wisdom, hard, hard edge to push into, but I think it's, it's really important. And yeah, I wonder why, like, yeah, I guess, is there that element of shame? Like, you know, maybe I won't be able to do this work if I start to, you know, share this stuff, could something happen? But yeah, how do we create that container to be more open to express that? And as you, you said, right, isn't that the container that we're trying to create for clients in therapy um, to, mm -hmm. to express that? And yeah, it's kind of funny how, um, yeah, kind of, uh, I guess, sometimes what we preach, we have a really hard time practicing. I just even think about the, to exactly. the topic of self-care for a lot of helpers, um, people in the helping profession. It's like, you know, we self-care, self-care. It's like, are we doing our own work at, at times? Um, and I know I've, I've been bad at it at times. You know, you get caught up and um, it's like, all right, I got to remind myself. I need to create the space to do that. Telling clients to do that, right? Um Get, get out of just treading water, but we all can fall into that yeah. treading water on the treadmill. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, I see that we have a few more minutes left. So I'm wondering, I guess, do you want to talk a little bit about your training program? Um, maybe a little bit more formally as we've hinted to it, to it um, here and there, but you know, how, how did the training program come together and you know, what are your goals? What are you really trying to do here? Um, and just anything that you want to share about it. And maybe we'll start with Veronica and then over to Harvey. It's, it's good that you're starting with her because I don't think it would have happened if it wasn't for Veronica. Oh, awesome. she's the one. <laughs> she's the one who said, "Like, oh, we don't have to wait till COVID ends. We can do this online on a webinar." And I said, "Oh no, I really don't want to do that. How can we do that on a webinar?" And she said, "No, trust me, it can work. It can work." And so then we did it. So anyway, I'll, but I really, I would have. If it was up to me, I would have waited another mm -hmm. year and just waited till we. Could yeah, maybe we can. You could add a little bit about how COVID has really. Um, helped shift things for you as well, right? Even doing online cap sessions with your clients and just the therapy. So if you want to throw anything about how COVID has kind of pushed some edges on your end um, with expanding or maybe, you know, limiting some of your your um, services here. Yeah, I'll share a little bit and can Harvey, can, you know, kind of share and we've been kind of sharing a little bit about kind of what, you know, the some of the focus of the training is. And, you know, as before COVID started, we have actually planned to have these in-person, more, you know, in-depth experiential trainings. And so we had this training in, in Hawaii and this training in Marin and, you know, it was kind of really excited about doing it. And um, we've been doing just these... Uh, one or two day trainings for the CIS students in the CPTR program. And so the, 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 there was some group that signed up for the training in March. And that's when the shutdown happened here in San Francisco. And that's what Harvey was referring to when we were thinking, are we going to do that online? Are we going to cancel the training? And 
then we decided to go forward with it and as well invited some other colleagues, you know, from, from Europe and some other people who were interested in it. And so had this first training, I think was about 20 people and, you know, and it went really well. It, it was kind of amazing to see that it was as well possible to bring people from, you know, places that they wouldn't be able to come to this training, you know, like from, from the Czech Republic and, and Spain and South Africa and, and Mm-hmm. Turkey, Turkey Egypt, yeah. Belgium, Egypt. So it was, you know, it kind of became exciting. And so the possibility of doing that. And and so we, you know, offered it and we, we called it the introductory uh, training to CAP. And so we did it again, but soon we, you know, just realized the limit of the one day. And even though we said it's an introductory training, there's just so many questions. And so, you know, slowly we developed this. Uh, right now we have five module programs. So we have five modules that, you know, the, the module one is really the most dense kind of introductory module with the, you know, different ways of working with ketamine. You know, we are focusing on the, the way how, we approach the work, but as well give information about other types of working, you know, in, in the IV uh, setup or other types of ketamine work. And then really the module two to four go to the topics that we felt are so important and oftentimes not covered in other trainings. So like the topics of the transference, counter-transference, somatic work, uh, really going more in depth into the transpersonal uh, work and understanding the integration of the spiritual experiences uh, that the clients might have, uh, work with attachment, and you know, then we have a kind of a module, and we're talking as well about group work and the online work, kind of as you mentioned, because we as well transitioned to you know, most of our clinicians are now being able to offer CAP ketamine assisted psychotherapy online. So we are teaching about that. And then the role play module is the module five, where uh, we're kind of like here, where we are on, on Zoom doing a role play of ketamine sessions where, you know, as a therapist and client and observer, and then the trainer comes in and, and you know, people really have that experience with the set and setting of CAP that we use with music and eye shades and the trainings are a mix of lectures and kind of like inquiries. We talk about different controversies in, in the field, kind of like what we, you know, just mentioned a little bit today um, and having experientials in, in that, that people can experience what some of the elements of the, of the process look like. And, you know, one thing I, I want to share that I'm you know kind of a, really excited about is that we've, you know, the training has been as well approved by APA for continuing education. And, awesome. you know, what is, I think great, you know, what, why I'm saying it is because, you know, so far there really hasn't been any training specifically on psychedelic aesthetic therapy approved by uh, organizations like APA. And so we feel that it's like a shift in the, in the whole field that something is shifting that it's like, oh, this, you know, it's, it's being more recognized and, and moving into the, the, the mainstream and, and, you know, it's so important to be able to, to have that. But Harvey, I'd love for you to share a little yeah, bit I'm, more. I'm about actually, I'm, as I'm listening to this conversation, I'm thinking about a whole other angle to kind of come in a more personal angle. So to make a very long story short, when I was in graduate school, my, my mission was really to be involved in clinical training because some of the best experiences I had were uh, good, really good mentoring, and I wanted to kind of pay that forward. And but around the time I was getting out of graduate school and getting my PhD, Reagan had destroyed the mental health system in the mm-hmm. United States, and so all the opportunities for those kind of positions and that kind of thing were gone. And so I really hesitatingly went into inpatient hospital work and then into private practice. That was never my game plan. I wanted to be involved in the training of the next generation of therapists. And then because I developed a specialty in DID and wrote a couple of books. People would seek me out, and so I did a lot of small group and one-on-one consultation. But I never dreamed about like, running a training program because I gave up those dreams decades ago. Mm-hmm. And so, accidentally, this whole process that started with my initial resistance, like "Oh no, Veronica, I don't want to do a webinar." And then once we started doing it, I thought, like, this is such a creative opportunity because all the things that we weren't trained in, that I think we should be trained in, we we get to make make it part of a training. So not to be critical of, I think all the training programs we participated in were really great, but they lacked certain 
specific topics. So then we get to present them and teach them. And so for me, it's like full circle. I didn't even realize it until talking about this today, that it's mm. like fulfilling a dream that I gave up a long time ago. And it's extremely creative. Making the slideshows is really creative. Thinking about, um, it, it's like really goodwill towards the future of the psychedelic renaissance and wanting to like have our, you know, our blessing and our perspective put into the future encyclopedia of the dharma, the collective dharma of psychedelic. So, yeah, so it's been really a lot of work, but really creative, fun. And um, yeah, we get to influence people, hopefully in a direction that will prevent certain casualties yeah. and that will promote certain, you know, maturational processes for individuals and for the field as a whole. So I hope that doesn't sound too soapboxy, but it really, I really mean what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's awesome. And um, yeah, I'm glad it's coming full circle for you. And um, I just love what you guys are doing. I really enjoyed the first two modules and, you know, something that you were saying in other trainings, maybe not getting it. Um, Veronica, you kind of just pointed to this before, but the controversies, I think that was probably one of my favorite parts, kind of talking about some of those controversies and, and politics within this and really kind of getting people to know maybe what they're stepping into, right? Because I think the mainstream is really highlighting it in a certain way. And then you know, it's, you guys have this kind of really nuanced approach that you're not typically getting in, you know, at conferences or maybe like other training and educational opportunities there. So I've been learning a ton from it and I just really appreciate your approach and also the synergies. Like I said, Veronica with the somatics and Harvey with the transpersonal, the, the shamanic aspects. I mean, for me, it's like, you're speaking my language and I, I just love learning from you both. So it's been, been really wonderful. And thank you so much, Kyle. And I, you know, like one thing I, I think about, it's like really like our, like what I think we've been able to do has been yes, through our, you know, learning and work, but through as well, the mutual love and friendship and connections that we have and that we, that we think are so important for this work, because you can do that with community. You know, we are met, like wired for relationships and there is so much healing that needs to happen to communities and our society and our relationship to the planet. And so that there is almost like this transmission we are hoping to give through the training of that, you know, that, that it's kind of different than just like information or how you do something. And, 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 and so kind of wanting to bring that into the training and, and sharing that and, and, and really have the hope that we can, you know, move to in-person trainings and retreats as, as that comes, but it's been the inspiration and excitement for me about what we've been doing. Awesome. Yeah. I would say one other thing. Do we have a couple minutes yeah. left? So I would say that when you use the word transmission, you know, I'm really into the whole idea of like receiving transmission, sharing transmission with humility, because sometimes it needs to be <laughs> censored or <laughs> translated. But I think to be able to let's talk about ketamine is a new ketamine and ketamine assisted therapy is pretty new. So just think about the, the term morphogenetic field for mm. a moment. That's where I wanted to go with this. So psilocybin has been on the planet for thousands of years, ibogaine for thousands of years. These medicines, ayahuasca, these medicines, I feel like have thousands of interdimensional spiritual support systems between ancestors and, and it's been going on for a long time. Ketamine is like a teenager in the spirit world, I feel like. And so in a sense, we are, really having a chance to impact the morphogenetic field mm. at a greater level than these other things which have been around so long. And so all the things we do, every session we have, I think of this and all of our trainings, we're kind of adding into this, helping this kind of teenage kind of form of therapy grow up and steward it in the way that we think it, you know, should be stewarded from the point of view of serving in the best possible ways, in the safest possible ways, in the most expansive possible ways. So it's kind of exciting to be raising a teenager rather than, you know, it's also cool to go to, you know, South America and be I'm sure to be apprenticed to somebody 5,000 year old tradition. I haven't done that, but it's also cool to be co-creating this new form and, you know, transmitting into it so that, uh, you know, we will, our, our visions will live on a thousand years from now. Somebody won't even know us, but they'll be working with ketamine. And it'll have been matured through our training and our, our contributions. Yeah. That's beautiful. That sound too, that sound too way out for you? Or? No, but it, it brings up an, an interesting thing. I think Joe and I were chatting about it a few weeks ago on the show, but um, just 
I guess with like the idea of cultural appropriation and thinking about, um, you know, using indigenous medicines that may not really kind of come from our lineage and, and our, you know, Western world. And just thinking about like the potential here, like how do we, I guess, really appreciate our Western medicines like MDMA, ketamine, and LSD? And how could we start to develop our own frameworks, our own kind of like mythology around it? And um, really kind of, and, you know, just really interesting hearing like ketamine is like our teenager, right? It's like, how do we really start to build, um, you know, frameworks around that and, and put those experiences out there? Maybe instead of romanticizing about other, you know, indigenous medicines, respect them, obviously. But yeah, just interesting to think about from like the Western therapeutic lens, like here are medicines within our lineage in a sense. And how do we maybe build on that and really influence its growth and potential here? Because I think when people think about ketamine, there you go, oh, you know, horse tranquilizer, right? I think that's the first thing that pops into most people's minds and don't don't really think it has a therapeutic um, action. But, you know, what what is our role here actually trying to create that for the next generations to come and destigmatize it and and really um explore the therapeutic potential here yeah so yeah i kind of think about the uh, the indigenous as kind of like grandparents and great-grandparents the wisdom from those traditions should be welcomed in and uh because there's lessons that have already been learned and then new lessons with our western chemicals that we're learning and western psychotherapy which does not exist in the indigenous world and you know, which may or may not have use in that world all the time, you know, yeah. but that, that body of knowledge, I think really has to be respected and there has to be some healing done. I don't really know exactly how that's going to happen, but I think we owe a great debt to the ayahuasqueros and the, totally. you know, the peyote. And, and, and so there's a repair, like the repair around slavery and the repair around indigenous, the assault on indigenous people and the, the genocide in America. And so I feel like there is repair. And I think it would be the psychedelic Renaissance consciousness and the maturation of us together that would come up with a you know subdivision of our movement. How do we make reparations mm. in this to this to this spiritual trauma that exists in the field? Because I feel like that unhealed spiritual spiritual trauma from the conquistadores and stuff in the new world it actually affects the war on drugs, and so it affects what we're doing in a ketamine session. It's all connected. So I feel like until that's repaired, the same way until the genocide and slavery are repaired in some very symbolic and practical ways, then our movement will be haunted by the ghosts. Yeah. And so I feel like it's an important, I don't have the vision for it, but I'm sure somebody else does. And if we get together and make that the weekend goal, let's come up with a vision for reparation, take medicine together in a sacred way, people will start coming up with how do we repair the damage that was done because it's not even acknowledged you know like the armenian genocide unacknowledged traumas of great magnitude tend to proliferate and spread as we know so there's another thought about hungry ghosts keep chasing us <laughs> yeah. yeah awesome well i noticed that we're at time so i'm wondering um if each of you want to ha have any closing remarks anything that you want to um, say and then also where can people find more information about your services and also the the training so veronica we'll start with you yeah so um so it, about it, just start with the, the practical and I, I think of a closing remark but uh yeah so our website is uh i think it's going to be probably listed at polarisinsight.com and we have all the details about our training there uh people can as well email us it's our first names at polarisinsight.com and um yeah, I've just been delighted to be here, have this conversation that's ongoing about development in the field and, you know, educating ourselves and developing ourselves as therapists and how can we bring these medicines forward. It's a, you know, we talk about is like a newest kind of what you just, we ended on, you know, this newest development in psychiatry and, and uh, psychology, but it's something that has been these oldest ways of healing in you know indigenous cultures and our ancestors you know in in Americas and in Europe and and that how we are shifting the way of looking at the psyche and the possibility of healing so that um, there is much more to come and um, really the importance of staying connected to ourselves and our humility 
as we go forward as, as, as uh, uh, you know, the cautions of the scaling and really get, doing the most ethical and um, connected work we can. So that's my, my hope mm-hmm. kind of going forward. Awesome. Thank you. I think I have to end with a note of gratitude, first and foremost, to Veronica, who has been amazing to work with all these years. And I think we're on an amazing co-creative course together. But to you, Kyle, I really want to say that I really appreciate that you, like, I feel like what, what you're doing and how you're holding the space for these conversations is completely in sync with how we're doing the therapy. Mm. And I feel like you allow for, you know, I think you're like, you're giving a lot of space, but asking questions and I just, you're allowing for improvisational dialogue to happen. And I feel like that's the best thing that could happen. And so this is your contribution. This is your transmission. This is your, you're affecting the future of the psychedelic renaissance by doing what you're doing. And I just want to, you know, bow to the way you're doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Such a beautiful way. Mm, I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful for you both and all the work that you've been doing. It's been resonating with me over the past year, just following your work and, and what you guys are doing and really just honored to be able to learn from you in the past few months more in depth. So yeah, deeply humbled. Thank you so much for your time and, and thank you for sharing your wisdom and um, all the insights with our audience. We really appreciate it. So Dr. Harvey Schwartz, Veronica Gold, thank you so much for being on the show. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Harvey Schwartz and Veronica Gold from the Polaris Insight Center. Again, if you want to learn more, uh, a little bit more about Veronica's work, you could go back into the Psychedelics Today archive and check that episode that I did with her. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed uh, chatting with Veronica and Dr. Schwartz. It's been really wonderful to you know be part of their uh, a couple of the modules of their ketamine training. I think they did a fantastic job with it so far. I'm really excited to be able to take more of the modules. You know, and they weren't the only other instructors there. Um, there are a few others from their team and the other co-founders of Polaris. So, you know, if you're interested in learning more about ketamine specifically, uh, again, definitely check that out at PolarisInsightCenter.com. I'd, I highly recommend it. I'm definitely going to try to finish up the modules when I get a chance. And yeah, I just really, really enjoyed uh, chatting with them and just talking about some of the nuances of, uh, you know, the, the psychedelic field here, some of the challenges that we're all, that we might be facing. I'm just skimming through the, the show notes here. And there's just a quote here by uh, Harvey saying, you know, the biggest issue going forward, I feel like for the field is how do we create access, scale it and not compromise the depth and intensity and integrity of the process. And that is definitely something, you know, I've been chewing on and I think Joe has been chewing on as well, you know, watching everything grow and just thinking about, you know, the potential here and, you know, the excitement that that's growing, but, you know, how do we keep integrity, move forward and also not compromise the depth and the intensity of this work. So I'll leave it at that. I think that is a, a, you know, just an interesting point to chew on. Again, if you want to support the show, you can do so by liking us and following us on our social medias channels, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, leave a review on iTunes. I don't know if any other podcast apps you can leave reviews, but um, if you have a, an Apple or you're on iTunes, leave us a review there. And also check out our courses, psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And again, I don't know if we talk about our two books too much, but uh, you can go over to Amazon and type in Psychedelics Today, and hopefully you'll see those uh, integration jur- the integration workbook and trip journal. Um, so those are some really fun books um, to aid you in your journey. So definitely check that out. You can get that on Amazon, physical copy, uh, the trip uh, journal, and then the integration workbook. So thanks everybody for checking us out at Psychedelics Today. Appreciate the support and we will catch you next time on our next episode. Be well, take care, stay safe. Thank you.